Welcome back class. I hope everybody's doing all right today. This video is going to continue talking about Aristotle. In the previous videos, we looked at Aristotle's account of eudaimonia in terms of virtuous activity. But in order to understand what that really means, we need to get a better understanding of what virtue is supposed to be. So in this video, we're going to start out just by looking at Aristotle and virtue ethics generally. Then we'll look at the nature of virtue specifically by talking about virtue as a character trait, the role that our inner lives play in understanding virtue, and the difference between intellectual and practical virtues. This will then lead to a discussion of four kinds of persons on Aristotle's position, the vicious person, the incontinent person, the continent person, and the virtuous person. So as I mentioned, Aristotle is one of the most famous defenders of what's known as virtue theory. This is a family of theory that approaches ethical thinking by emphasizing and centering the concept of virtue. Now, this emphasis on virtue isn't limited just to this Western philosophical tradition that Aristotle belongs to. There's a long history of appealing to the concept of virtue to understand the good life and ethics in Confucian thought, in Buddhist ethics, etc. So a lot of ethical theories about human well-being or alternatively about the nature of morality, they oftentimes try to search for simple rules or principles that we can apply to determine what would be practically best for our own self-interest, or alternatively, what would be the best thing to do from a moral perspective in terms of right and wrong action. But virtue ethicists reject this idea that there's any simple formula for determining how to act. So if you want to know what's the right thing to do, you can't just consult a rule book and that's going to sort of tell you, do this. Ethics is a complex, messy area of decision-making, one that requires emotional maturity and sound judgment. Morality is not like geometry or civil engineering. We have moral rules of thumb that can help us in most situations, but strict obedience to such rules is bound to lead us into error, and the rules, of course, will sometimes conflict with one another. What we need in all cases is a kind of sensitivity. It's something very different from a rote application of preset rules. So in this passage, our book is focusing on virtue theory's picture of morality, about right and wrong action. We, however, are currently talking about the nature of human well-being instead. But similar remarks apply to virtue theory's picture of well-being. They're going to say, look, you can't just say, here's one rule, apply that to this situation, and that'll tell you what the best thing to do is for your own well-being. They're going to say, no, it depends upon the details. There's no one-size-fits-all model you can apply to a specific situation. In order to figure out how to make your life the best that it can be, you need to be able to be sensitive to the details of that situation. So in this regard, in epistemology, there's a distinction between two kinds of knowledge. There's knowing that something is the case, and there's also knowing how. Knowledge that is knowledge that a particular claim is true. As an example, I know that 2 plus 3 equals 5. I know that that's true. I know that the Earth orbits the Sun. I know that that claim is true. On the other side, though, know-how is when you have a skill or ability to act or behave in a certain way. I know how to swim, and I know how to play the drums, because I have these abilities. This distinction between know that and know-how is really important for understanding the next passage from our book. It says, As virtue ethicists see things, moral understanding is not just a matter of knowing a bunch of moral facts. Moral wisdom is a kind of know-how that requires a lot of training and experience. What it doesn't require is a superior IQ or a vast reading list. So the claim here is just knowing a bunch of facts about what's right or wrong, or about what good lives look like or don't look like. That's not going to be enough to have moral wisdom because moral wisdom is a skill. Just like you can't just read about riding a bike and know all the truths that you had to move the pedals in order to move the wheels. In order to have the skill of riding a bike, you need to practice. You need to gain this know-how. Similarly, knowing true things about human well-being that's not going to give you wisdom for living a good life. Having that kind of moral wisdom is a skill. In order to get that wisdom, you can't just read a book. You need to practice these things. That's where the training and experience comes in. As it says, moral wisdom is an extremely complicated kind of skill. It does require knowledge of the way the world works, so it does require some know that, but it demands more than that. We must also have a great deal of emotional intelligence. 
So emotions are a critical aspect of this skill as well. Like I said, this passage from the book is again focused on virtue theory's picture of morality, but similar remarks apply to virtue theory's picture of the good life or human well-being. So if virtue is going to be at the center of our picture of the good life and of morality, it's going to be important that we understand what virtue really means on this theory. So a virtue is meant to be an admirable, excellent, or good character trait of a person. Some examples here would be courage, generosity, honesty, kindness, humility. When people have these traits, we think that's admirable of that person. A vice is a non-admirable or non-excellent or bad character trait of a person. Some examples are arrogance, dishonesty, vanity, rashness, cowardice. These are things we don't want to emulate. These are not admirable character traits of that person. Right. Now notice a virtue is a character trait. It's not merely a habit of behaving in certain ways. Character traits are deeper and define the kind of person someone is. And so character traits involve not just how a person behaves, what they do, but it also involves several aspects of a person's inner life, their perceptions, thoughts, and motives that lead to that behavior. So another way to put this is a virtue is understood not just in terms of how a person is disposed to behave or how they act, but also in terms of the inner life that explains why they're disposed to act in those ways. So let's consider an example here. Honesty. An honest person isn't merely someone who is disposed to tell the truth. Even if you tell the truth all the time, that doesn't mean you have the character trait of honesty. It also depends upon why you're disposed to tell the truth. What leads you? What's going on inside your mind, inside of you as a person that leads you to behave in that way? For instance, an honest person needs to at least, the reason that they tell the truth must at least partly be because they care about and value the truth. If a person always tells the truth, but only because inside, in their inner life, they're just really scared of getting caught and don't want to be punished, well then, even if they tell the truth all the time, they don't have the character trait of honesty because they don't have the right emotions and motivations backing up this behavior. And it's not just emotions, it's an ability to perceive the world around you. An example from the book, courage, for instance, requires that we correctly perceive various threats or dangers, control our fear in a reasonable way, be moved by a noble end, and act accordingly. So, as I said, virtue does have something to do with our behavior, but it has just as much to do with our ability to perceive and notice important aspects of our situations. So a person who is courageous has to be able to correctly perceive which things in their environment might be a threat or might not be a threat. And a courageous person needs to have the ability to have various kinds of thoughts. They need to be able to think about this is a dangerous thing, this is not a dangerous thing. They also need to be able to be motivated by various kinds of reasons. If they have the thought that it would be good for them to save a child from a burning building, but they aren't able to be motivated by that fact, well, then that doesn't lead them to be a courageous person. So overall, virtues require correct theoretical knowledge about truths concerning the world, practical knowledge about how to act and what's valuable or not valuable, and emotional intelligence where our emotions are able to react appropriately relative to these perceptions. So the idea of virtue involving both theoretical and practical aspects is important for distinguishing those two kinds of virtues for aerosol that we talked about before. There's intellectual virtues, and there's those ethical, character, or practical virtues. The intellectual virtues, these are the admirable character traits or excellences that pertain to the part of humans that has the ability or skill to reason. Some examples here are wisdom, scientific knowledge, understanding, intelligence, art, and craft. So this you can think is in terms of the skills we have for gaining knowledge about the world around us. For instance, about which things are true, scientific knowledge, knowing that 2 plus 3 equals 5, and being able to have the skill of gaining further mathematical knowledge. But also the skill to gain knowledge about, say, about the physical sciences, but also to gain knowledge about morality, about what's right or wrong, what's good or bad, etc., but on the other side, these ethical character or practical virtues, these are 
these are admirable character traits that pertain to the part of us that can't reason but can still follow reason. So our emotions, our desires, and motivations, they don't reason themselves, but they can still listen to our reason. So yet again, when I recognize that that spider isn't dangerous, I can train myself not to fear that spider too much, more than it deserves relative to how much danger it actually presents. So yeah, I should feel a decent amount of fear from a black widow. But a normal everyday garden spider, I don't actually know very much about spiders, but I shouldn't feel too much fear. And so I need to teach myself how to feel the appropriate amount of fear, and my emotion then will then learn to listen to my reason. Similarly with my desires and my motivations. So courage, honesty, kindness, generosity, humility, these all involve an emotional makeup that will respond appropriately relative to what our reason tells us about those other truths about the world. Like courage, my fear will listen to what my reason tells me about what is or is not dangerous. Finally, this leads us into distinguishing between four kinds of persons and how their reason is working inside them. So the four kinds of person are the vicious person, the incontinent person, the continent person, and the virtuous person. The vicious person is someone who believes they ought to do the wrong thing, they desire to do that wrong thing, and they actually do the wrong thing. And as a result, their beliefs, desires, and their actions, they all line up. And as a result, they feel pleasure. They don't feel any kind of conflict because they're doing exactly what they want to do. But the incontinent person is slightly different. This is the person that knows the right thing to do, and they know that they should do it, but they give in to their impulse or desire to do the wrong thing. This is the person who is weak-willed. They give in to that temptation. And this person doesn't feel complete pleasure from doing the wrong thing since they feel regret as a result. So they do exactly what they want to do, but they know that they shouldn't want to do it. They just aren't able to get their desires to listen to what their reason is telling them is the right thing to do. And they feel regret as a result. And so they feel conflicted between these parts of themselves. The continent person knows they should do what's right, and they do what is right because they are able to resist their impulse or desire to do the wrong thing. As a result, some of their pleasure is frustrated because they don't get to do what they want to do. They still feel that motivation to do the wrong thing. So the incontinent person is like the person who looks at the cake. They're like, oh, I shouldn't eat that. No, it's not good for me. I, I really shouldn't. And they're like, oh, heck with it. And then they eat it anyways. And then they feel terrible afterwards. Like, I shouldn't have done that. I know I should. I, I regret that. But the continent person is a person who's like, oh, I really want to eat that cake. It looks so good, but I know I shouldn't. And then they resist. They're, they're strong-willed. They're able to resist that temptation. But they still feel a little bit bad because they still had to resist that temptation. They didn't get to do what they want to do. The virtuous person, though, they know the right thing to do. They do the right thing. And they desire to do the right thing. So this is like the person who looks at the cake like, it's not good for me. I, I have no desire for it. They train themselves not to desire the things that are bad for them, and not to desire the wrong things, and they train themselves to desire the right things, the things that are good for them. All parts of themselves, their knowledge, their desires, their actions, all line up, and they experience full pleasure from doing the right thing since that's exactly what they desired to do. So here's a chart to try to summarize. The vicious person, their beliefs are bad. They believe they ought to do the wrong thing. So their reason is failing them. It's not working well in giving them beliefs. Their actions are also bad and their passions are bad. They desire to do the wrong thing. The incontinent person, well, their reason is working well when it gives them beliefs. They know what the right thing to do is. Their actions are bad, though. Their actions aren't able to follow that reasons and their passions are are bad because they desire to do the wrong thing. They know they shouldn't desire to do it, but they do. They aren't able to get their desires to listen to their reason. So their reason is failing them as well. The continent person, while well, their reason gets them good beliefs and their reason is able to so get their actions to listen to their beliefs about what's right or wrong, good or bad, but their passions, they still feel that desire to do the wrong thing. They aren't able to get their motivations to listen to their reason as well. And so yet again, their reason is not fully functioning as well as it could. But then we get to the virtuous person. Well, their reason tells them what's good and bad, right and wrong. 
their actions, they're able to get their actions to listen to their reason about what's right or wrong, and their passions, they want to do that. They desire to do the right thing. And so their reason is working on all cylinders, and this is the virtuous person. That's the good life according to Aristotle. And now, because of this, they feel pleasure as a result. So this is very different than hedonism. Hedonism, the idea is your life is good because you feel pleasure. But on Aristotle's view, the pleasure is more like the effect of living a good life rather than the cause of it. You live a good life because you're exercising virtue and because your desires, actions, and belief line up when you're living that good life, you're using your reason well, you thereby as a result feel pleasure. So a good life will be pleasurable, but it's not good because you experience pleasure. You experience pleasure because you're living the good life of exercising virtue. So that's it for this video. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.